Well, I believe it is what? Tuesday? Tuesday. So have a great Tuesday. We're glad to have you here with us. Uh, just kind of plopped on a little earlier this morning. Just happened to be sitting here and thought, well, let's give everybody a chance to get in and see what's going on. And I tilt my head back like that because I got a little bit of a bifocal in that thing. And there's glasses, so that's kind of why I do that. So I don't know about your glasses, but I wondered, I used to wonder why do people clean their glasses all the time? But I think after they get a little older, they do collect dust and different things. So there's that. Benita, it's good to see you this morning. I hope you and your family are getting ready for Thanksgiving and what Tuesday Tuesday so have a great Tuesday we're glad to have you here with us uh, just kind of plopped on a little earlier this morning just happened to be sitting here and thought well let's give everybody a chance to get in and see what's going on and I tilt my head back like that because I got a little bit of a bifocal in that thing in those glasses so that's kind of why I do that so I don't know about your glasses, but I wondered, I used to wonder why do people clean their glasses all the time? But I think after they get a little older, they do collect dust and different things. So there's that. Benita, it's good to see you this morning. I hope you and your family are getting ready for Thanksgiving and hope everything's going better or good or you're getting good results on what you're dealing with. So we always want to be praying for you and thinking about you and, uh, just keep fighting. That's really all we can do, isn't it? So, Karen Midkiff, it's good to see you. And Biff, good to see you guys. And yesterday, I got to be honest, I learned something. Well, I learn something every day, right? My wife says I'm a slow learner. So, I mean, I'm always learning something. But um, about Jesus, you know, the more I, that we go through this gospel, the more I realize, you know, Jesus did tell us. You know, he told him. At the end over there, uh, and we'll probably come up to that, I think it's around Matthew chapter 24, when he told them about the tribulation period. And and yesterday, we talked about how John the Baptist, uh, how he ends sort of the Old Testament, and now he's opening up heaven to everybody. So John the Baptist, we look at a guy that was out there just being loud and obnoxious, that gets his head, gets beheaded. But John the Baptist had a clear jo job to do, and John did it. And uh, it's pretty strong uh, in that he opened up heaven to the rest of the world. So Myrtle, it's good to see you. We got our Ohio people here, Biff and Myrtle. And uh, somebody was talking about Indiana last night and how flat it is and how the um, how the uh, wind just constantly blows up there. And I said, "Yep, I understand it. Been out there in uh, Ohio and Indiana a few times." So. Uh, just trying to give everybody a minute to get on here. It's good to see Connie this morning. Good to see Tony. We are in uh, chapter 11 of the book of Matthew, and we kind of ended yesterday with John the Baptist sending a message, Jesus, is it really you? And Jesus starts preaching on the fact that here's what John did. John closed out the Old Testament, and now John has helped open the door for the whole world, for all of us, to get to this place called heaven. So it's pretty strong work what John's done. Uh, and then we also got into the violence or, or the fact that uh, the dad will be against the children, the children will be against the parents. When it's, when when Jesus comes and, and when Jesus is doing his business about here's what the kingdom of heaven is like. So good morning, uh, Maureen and Glenn. Happy birthday to Glenn again. But we're getting into this and starting to see that, man, when Jesus is saying, I didn't come to bring peace, I came to bring a sword. And as we talked about with a sword, you know, it cuts, it divides, you know, and that's what Jesus is saying. You know, I, I, I've really, the last couple of elections, I've lost a couple good friends uh, because I really assumed we all pretty much believe the same fundamental things. Um, especially when somebody gets on Facebook and tells me they're Christian, I assume we have the Christian belief of everybody's life is important, whether it's a baby in the womb, uh, you know, or, or somebody out here that's, you know, a drug addict, everybody 
You know, we need to pray for life for everybody, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is guaranteed in our Constitution. But I find that, man, we all don't believe the same thing. And I guess it goes back to all the denominations. You know, even with all these denominations that are out there, we don't even worship the same way. And our founding fathers were smart enough and probably guided by God to say, worship any way you want to worship, right? Because there's so much fighting over over what you believe and what you don't believe and judge me and don't judge me. And, you know, and, and that's what Jesus is saying here is that, man, it, it, this is not going to be a cakewalk, right? This is not going to be simple because there's so many people out here that just don't get it. And he kind of gets over here to about uh, Matthew 11, verse 16. And here's what Jesus says. He says, um, uh, da, 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 let me see here. But whereunto shall I liken this generation? Now, what's he talking about with this generation? Jesus is saying, man, these people just, I mean, they want to come out for the free food. They want to come out for the festivity. They want to come out and see John the Baptist or me challenge the Pharisees or the religious powers of the day, but they're not a bit committed to this thing. And Jesus goes on, he says, it's like sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows, meaning their friends, and saying, we have piped unto you and you have not danced. We have mourned unto you and you have not lamented. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, John has a devil. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber, a friend of the publicans and sinner. But wisdom is justified of her children. So when I read the footnote here before we got started on this, these people, I mean, you're never going to get a better message than the one directly from John the Baptist, which was, you know, uh, symbolic of Elijah and some of, you know, prophesied about the, the next Elijah, right? So that's what he was, the forerunner of Jesus Christ. Hey, the good news is at hand. I'm going to baptize you uh, into repentance and, and tell you you need to repent. But one is mightier than me that is coming. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit of God. You're going to have God living inside of you. You would think for a bunch of poor people in a place where there's no TV and no internet, and no social media distracting us, that people would be like, man, we better get involved in this situation, right? So um, that's what the illustration is. You know, they're not hearing, they're not producing, they're not, you know, they're rejecting both John and Jesus, right? And still today, with all the written evidence that we have and the fact that our faith, that we have to have enough faith to get saved, but truly once we start getting into this Bible and reading it, studying it and understanding it, folks, this is the real word of God. And you say, well, give me some proof. Well, the number one proof is it still exists. And this book, the last time somebody added a page to it was over 2,000 years ago, right? Or roughly 2,000 years ago. This book goes on to tell me that when when God's into something, one day is, a, is, a, is as a thousand years with God and a thousand years is as one day. And what that basically means here is our time frame is nothing. Our life is a vapor. But with God, one day in, in, in his existence, since he has already existed, would be equivalent to a thousand years for us. See? So, so we're not dealing with the same thing. Now, we can deal with the Lord in all eternity and live forever and be self exist Well, we won't be self-existent like he is. But we can have all the things that God has, Right? He can give us eternal life. He will give us a glorified body. He will take us to a place with no more sin, no more sorrow, and no more pain. But yet Jesus is saying, look, the illustration here is this game of weddings and funerals was what they were talking about. It must have been a game the kids played. And the idea was, the idea was that these kids can't even decide. See, people can't decide today, so they think they're neutral on following Jesus. Well, if you're not following Jesus, you're following the devil, and that's dangerous ground because any second we could go out of here. Maybe it's a car wreck. Maybe it's a, you know, we feel sick one day and we go to the doctor and find out cancer is eating us down to the bone. I mean, it happens all the time. We don't know how many days that we've got, and you've got to be prepared for this thing. 
And just to walk around with this head knowledge, oh, yeah, I know a little bit about God. Oh, yeah, I go to church when I get time. Oh, yeah, you know, I read the Bible sometimes. You know, I don't think it's going to pass the mustard test, right? Because you've got to understand what is going on here. So anyway, I'm going to move along. Now, here's Jesus as he finishes up this. He's going to say, let me tell you about the judgment that's coming. So then Jesus began to upbraid the cities. That means to rebuke. I think we hit on this a little bit. Jesus is rebuking people. We think, oh, Jesus, the Lamb of God, he just, he loved the children and let them sit on his lap. And, you know, he said all these pretty things. But here he is, he's rebuking these people. And I think I did read this about Chorazin and Capernaum uh, and how it's going to be more tolerable for them, uh, for uh, Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than it's going to be for these people because they're rejecting the truth of God and there can't be any more of a proof of God than the first hand, you know, here he is, right? And it's just, and, and, and you and I probably don't thank the Lord as much as we should because why did he choose Karen? Why did he choose Tony Smith? Why did he choose Maureen Foster? Why did he choose Brooke Lunsford, right? And, and the thing is, he's tried to choose us all, right? Um, the, what is it? The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. That's not the one I'm looking for. What's the verse? Many are called, but few are chosen. And I, I used to get that backwards as a kid. I'm like, well, many have been called, but few have been chosen. So God didn't choose them. What that means is people aren't choosing to follow the Lord. And right here is your, right here is your verses on that. Meaning that even Jesus in the very flesh and all the miracles and all the things he did, people still were not that interested in following Jesus. So it's pretty scary. So Jesus tells them about how it's going to be more tolerable for the most hideous places in the world and places where fire and brimstone, uh, you know, uh, cascaded down on them uh, there at Sodom and Gomorrah. And he's telling them, you know, it's going to be better for them than it's going to be for you. That's pretty strong talk, right? So then he goes on further and he says, who is wise? And he said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent and has revealed them unto the babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal to him. So once again, Jesus is kind of setting this thing up, making himself equal with God, saying nobody truly knows all I can do and all I want to do for people, but Father who has sent me. And then Jesus extends this invitation in verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, what does he mean here? Listen, life is a burden. Life is hard. Man, maybe I lost my job. Maybe, you know, I've been embarrassed at something. Maybe I failed at something. Maybe all these things. And man, I'm, I'm just, I'm tore all to pieces, maybe because of my kids, or maybe something's going on in my life. You know, all these things that are going on out here, okay? Um... And, and and it's separating, it's drawing me away. And then all of a sudden, God convicts me of my situation, helps me to see I need a savior, helps me to see that I need him. And here's the invitation, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, right? And I will give you rest. Why is there rest immediately upon believing in Jesus and saying, save me, Lord? Well, the reason for that is a lot of times, you know, we've got to be at the low points of our life before we see a need for help. And then we've got to be at a situation in our life sometimes where we can't get help from anybody else. You know, if you ever really get hammered on something, maybe business or something, and I've been hammered a couple of times. I was involved in the dot-com bust and the housing bust and, uh, you know, some other things over the years. And I mean, I really got to see, you know, what it would be like diving into a swimming pool with no water. <laughs> and it's not funny in many respects, but I'm telling you, I understand when you think it won't get better. You think, you know, oh, I'm so embarrassed. I can't believe this. This is, you know, and that's the devil talking to us in so many cases because he doesn't want you to share. I know how you feel, you know, you know, 
you, I know how you feel, you know, well, Lunsford, you don't know how I feel. You got this, that, and the other, and you know, you got a job and you got whatever, you know, but we've all gone through those things, you know, I could lose everything. Used to, I like to go to the city mission and make sure they knew my name down there in case I was ever homeless. At least I would be able to go down and say, Hey, Mitch, you, you all know me. I think Mitch is the guy that still runs the city mission. Because, you know, we all think that we're invincible or we think nothing bad's ever going to happen, but that's just not the way life is. And, um, you know, I don't know how bad it's going to get. But but there are things that weigh us down. There is sin that's in our life. It's the number one thing weighing us down. But as we look around and we see people struggling, I saw somebody post on Facebook this morning how hard it is to watch somebody that you love sink further and further into the drug usage. Well, I can't imagine that. That would be the most terrible thing in the world. Or to watch a toxic relationship and take your kids' grades down in school or whatever it might be, you know, all these things are going on and I need some relief on it. How do I get this relief? Jesus says, come unto me if you're heavy laden, heavy burdened. If all these things are going on, come. And then he says, you know, come unto me and I will give you rest. I got saved. I never felt such a peace in March 1997, so I got saved. What could I do? I jump up, I go tell Grandma, hey, Grandma, guess what happened? I knew I got saved, right? I didn't know the Romans wrote a salvation and say every verse that, you know, had, but I knew I got saved because I surrendered right there to God. So I go tell her, you know, what's next, and as I've told you many times, she says, get over here Sunday morning at 9.30, I'll show you what's next, and that was we need to go to church, right? So there it was. Um, now, what else? I surrender, and then verse 29, Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. See, somewhere in our lives, we got to quit just trying to be everything to everybody, right? I got I mean, I got all these little businesses that d don't really do anything. I mean, I mean, they do something, you know? And you hate to give them up because you want to be diversified. But at the end of the day, you know, I'm starting to look at this stuff. And I'm like, man, it just ain't worth the aggravation, right? It just isn't worth it because why? You know, I can't take anything with me that I would make down here. And I find that when I do make a little something, I usually give it to somebody. You know what I'm saying? Because there's always something going on. Somebody needs something, Right. And, and and it's necessary, and that's why I love the little nonprofit that we have going on. But with Jesus, he says, take up my yoke. See, Jesus' expectations are not a physical sweating service to the Lord for the rest of your life. But being a living sacrifice, there are things that I do need to do for the Lord, which is to take up that yoke upon yourself. So yoke up with Jesus, right? But at the same time, there is a load, there is a job to do as a Christian in society, and our job is to tell other people how to get to Jesus, how to live Jesus in front of other people. Now, Jesus goes on, he says, I'm meek and lowly in heart. What is he saying, meek and lowly? I think what he's saying is I'm humble. I'm never trying to tell anybody, you know, as Christians, we're not supposed to make ourselves out to be better than somebody else, but at the same time, we're supposed to be sure of our message, and our message is, we serve a God that's going to prepare a place for us. And he had a death, a burial, and a resurrection before he went to prepare that place so he could clear the way for you and I to be born again in his eyes, regenerated as new creatures in God's eyes. Now, if you've made as many mistakes and you failed as much as me and you're 30 years old <clears throat> and you get a do-over, who wouldn't want that, Right? So I got that do-over when I was age 30, but it didn't change the circumstances. I still had to live through all the craziness and poor decision-making, right? So you live through that, and I really believe a lot of my failure and a lot of the things were straight from the devil and the demonic crowd because he didn't want me to get excited about the things of God, and he didn't want me to be on here telling you how to get to Jesus. He didn't want me to come on here and say, you know, I know how you feel when you're hurting. Because, see, a lot of people say, oh, I know how you feel. Oh, really, do you? Well, no, I haven't been through what you've been through, but, man, I know how you feel. Chances are you don't know if you haven't been through it, right? And, and that's why there's so many things in this world. Oh, I know how you feel. 
Oh, you need to suck it up. Oh, you need to be tougher. Oh, you need to... Listen, there's only so much toughness, right? And then you've got to have a hard head. And you can see all my head right there shining like a cue ball. Listen, your head's got to be hard to keep getting up and keep getting up and keep getting knocked down and keep coming forward. But, you know, for Jesus, that's what we want to do, right? Because Jesus ends this with, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, the expectations for a Christian are just to be a light to the world. Maybe I can say some things. Maybe I can witness to some people, right? But I need to live love, joy, peace, and long-suffering because guess what's inside of me? The Holy Spirit of God from the moment I get saved. So now let's get into Jesus on the Sabbath day. The Pharisees saw Jesus doing something on the Sabbath day and they went plumb crazy. These folks in the Old Testament Jewish people were not allowed to do anything on the Sabbath day, okay? But they saw Jesus and they said, Behold, thy disciples, they do that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day. And Jesus turned and said unto them, Have you not read that David, when he was a hungered, and they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God, and he did eat of the showbread, bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priest? Have you not also read in the law how that on the Sabbath day the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. If you had known this and what I mean, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Ye have not condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. So once again, Jesus is telling them, look, I'm the Son of God. I'm way more important than this. And, you know, he's basically saying, you know, you're gagging at a gnat, you're swallowing a camel, you got all this tradition, you got all this hardness of heart, and you're missing the point of this thing. I'm telling you, I'm the son of God, my followers are hungry, the food is here, it's not going to it's not gonna hurt anybody that they eat this. And it doesn't matter what day of the week it is, because they got to have something to eat. Because see, in the other days... You had, I think it was six days to do whatever you were going to do, but that Sabbath day meant you rested and you didn't do anything that even resembled work, right? So chapter 12, I'm going to kind of pass over the first part of chapter 12 uh, because I read to you a little bit about the Sabbath day. The next thing is the man with the withered hand, okay? Um, and uh, I think we pretty much, you know, the miracles, it's great. Jesus, you know, healed people. Why did he do it? Because we didn't have social media. We didn't have newspaper. So he had to leave a lasting impression. So if he takes a man that's been blind for 30 or 40 years in a camp or in a town, and all of a sudden this guy can see what a testimony that would leave behind, right? Let's see. So let me go a little bit further. Um, the Pharisees went out, they held counsel against Jesus, how they might destroy Jesus. So once again, by chapter 12 of Matthew, it's intensifying. You know, the Pharisees are going to destroy Jesus. They don't like what he's saying because he's hurting their feelings. He, If he's getting on anybody and really talking mean to somebody, it's them. Why is he doing it? Because they're just, they're cruel, they're corrupt, you know, they're so caught up in the rules and the regulations that they forgot to love the people and take care of the people. So when Jesus realized and knew that the Pharisees were coming after him, he withdrew himself and, and a great multitude followed him and he healed them all. See, once again, I don't want to go so fast over the healing process, but everybody can be healed today. Well, you got cancer? No, you may not be healed of cancer, but you can be healed from a life in hell's fire and be healed unto eternal life in a place called heaven. Follow me? That's what you and I are after today. We're not after this thing out there where, you know, oh, I get to be, you know, Time Magazine Man of the Year. I get to be a famous actor. You know, I come up with an invention that's going to make billions of dollars, right? You can do all those things, and that's wonderful, but you still better have Jesus at the top of your flow chart in what's important in your life, right? So here's Jesus, you know, they're following him and he's healing all of them. He'll heal you today. Oh, you don't know what's going on. Oh, you don't know about my heartbreak. I know, but you got to tell Jesus. Then you got to ask him to forgive you and then you've got to move on. It doesn't matter. 
what you've come from. Doesn't matter what you've done. You know, now the, here's the problem. It doesn't matter what you've done, but you've got to repent. You've got to let the Holy Spirit lead you in your life. You've got to start reading and studying this Bible. Got to listen to some Sunday school. Got to listen to some good preaching. Because if you get saved, but you never grow in Christ, you could fall right back to where you were. Now, the big debate would come, did you ever really get saved? See, when I really got saved, I never did have times in my life when I got, I said, Lord, save me. And I'll never do this again. I never had that. I had times when I was under conviction and I promised I was going to get saved. But then by the time a Wednesday church service or a Sunday church service rolled around, I, I had let that pass me. You see what I'm saying? But in March 1997, in an afternoon at the house, I surrendered. And I can take you to the place and I can tell you the time where the Lord saved me, right? So there's where we're at in that situation. So... um. Let's see. So by the time we get down here to halfway through Matthew chapter 12, in verse 22, Pharisees, um, uh, th well, hold on a second. Then was one brought unto Jesus, possessed with the devil. He was blind and dumb, and he healed Je and Jesus healed him, insomuch that the blind and the dumb both spake, and he could see. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? Because remember, the Messiah is going to come out of the line of Judah. The Messiah is going to come from not only uh, the line of Judah as the, as the twelve one of the twelve tribes, but also uh, through David, whose kingdom was never going to end. King David, right? King David through Solomon and through I forget which king, but but there it is. So when the Pharisees heard that they compared Jesus or said this is the son of David. This fellow doth not cast out devils, by, but by Beelzebub and the prince of the devil. So once again, Jesus is doing a very good work for somebody, and they're saying the devil did the good work. Well, the devil doesn't do good works very often, right? And Jesus knew their thoughts, and he said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. Now, how shall then his kingdom stand? And if by and if I by Beelzebub cast out devils by whom your children cast them out, therefore shall be your judge. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come to you. So as mean, as cruel, as ignorant as these Pharisees are being, Jesus is saying, look, I'm telling you, the kingdom of God has come. You can be <clears throat> in the kingdom of God and live forever, but you got to recognize what I'm doing. What I'm doing is not an evil thing, right? What I'm doing is to show you the power of the living God, fulfilling all the prophecies, even quoting you Old Testament prophecies as we go through this. Um, and telling you, you know, hey, do you remember reading this about the showbread and David? Do you remember reading this about Tyre and Sidon, or, or not Tyre and Sidon, but do you, you know, I guess it would have been, and then Sodom and Gomorrah. You've read this. You know these things are true. Why would I be telling you this if it wasn't accurate stuff? So, mm, pretty scary, isn't it? So, he that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Okay, so he says, or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil the house. So once again, you know, Jesus is saying, look, you know, you got to take control. If you break into somebody's house, you better be strong enough to tie up the owner because he's going to try to kill you or exact revenge or anything. So Jesus says, can you not see that my power is greater than the power of evil that was in this guy? You know, I mean, are you not believing the things that you've read for these thousands of years, right? So wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. For years I had trouble with that. I'm like, what does that even mean? But what it's saying is, I could murder somebody. And if I was brokenhearted about it and I confessed it to Jesus and I said I'm brokenhearted and Jesus knew it, he would forgive me of that. 
right? Whatever I've done, Jesus will forgive me. But if I go through life and I never accept Jesus' work, right? If I never accept what Jesus has done for me, that's blaspheming against the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit's trying to come to me that God's trying to send that Holy Spirit down. The Holy Spirit wants to live in me and I say, I'm not interested. I don't care about the things of God. I don't care what you tell me. I'm just not gonna believe. I've blasphemed against the Holy Spirit of God because God's plan was for me to have that Holy Spirit living inside of me to get stronger and stronger in the ways and the things of God and to one day see Jesus face to face and hear enter in. Thou good and faithful servant, thou hast been servant over a few things, or I'm sorry, thou hast been faithful over a few things, I will make you ruler over many. That's the plan. That's where we're at in this thing, okay? So, have a wonderful day. I hope you got something out of the lesson. But Jesus tells it like it is, man. He rebuked those people. He knows what the Pharisees are doing. You know, he could strike all those Pharisees dead and, and that would probably get everybody's attention. But that's not what he does. You know, he's still telling them, look, see what's going on here. Understand, you know, I am the son of God. I am telling you I'm the son of God. You've watched me take the evil out of this man's soul. I can take the evil out of your soul. Right? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. We just read that verse. Why, how do you take it out of me, Lord? Because I have the power to make you a new creature in me. Now, how do I, how am I in God? I, it's kind of a play on words because I'm basically saying, um, I, I think so. I'm well, not blaspheming because, like, I can, I could say cuss words about God and I could be blaspheming God, I think. I could say, um, blaspheming God saying, you know, I'm saved and I'm going to go to heaven, but it doesn't matter what you do. You can't go to heaven. That's probably, that could be blaspheming the Holy Spirit because I'm telling you, you can't get the Holy Spirit, you know, because of what I've made up, you know, certain denominations blaspheme the Holy Spirit because they've added rules and regulations to getting saved. And so that's dangerous. But the, the, the main point is basically, yes, about the number one thing is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit means you have rejected the teachings of Jesus. You've rejected Jesus calling you or convicting you of your situation. And that is the one unpardonable sin because Jesus is not going to sugarcoat it and he's not going to look past the fact that you didn't see that Jesus was tortured to death for you. You didn't see that he had to give up the ghost for you, that he had to live on this earth and struggle for his whole life in order to have this relationship. We're not going to be able to slip around that technicality and get into heaven someday. So, so yes, part of it, Terry, for sure. Um, and, and that was the verse we just read. That's in Matthew chapter 12, if you want to glance back through that. Guys, I got a roll. I hope you guys have a wonderful day and we will talk to you soon. Lord, we're thankful that you gave us this Bible. We're thankful that it's in a way, in a language we can understand. So we thank you for the translations over the years. We know that a lot of translations nowadays are leaving out words and adding words, and it's pretty scary. But Lord, we thank you that we're with the King James Study Bible and the doctrinal footnotes that does help us to understand it. And I would say that if anybody's on here and you're reading something else, that's wonderful. Just read it and whatever but take it back to your King James Study Bible and make sure that it's lining up um, the way that uh, it needs to line up. And I may not have all the answers, but uh, there's a lot of people that know a lot about the Bible in this Sunday school class. So if I can't answer your questions, I will forward you on to someone who can. So we appreciate you guys. We really, you know, we would not be here without you guys listening and keeping me accountable. We ask for you to be with our prayer list that those that are on every heart here, we thank you that Myrtle said her prayer had been answered with her sister and that's wonderful. Uh, we ask you to continue to be with each one of us that are on here. We all need prayer. We all need to pray for each other. We have a prayer list on our hearts of unspoken requests uh, that, that dwell there, but we never share it with others or maybe we do, but we still have a list of things that we we want our prayers answered. So Lord, we ask you to hear the prayer. We ask you to bring anything that's wrong in our life or something we may be doing to our remembrance so we can cast that out uh, to you. 
and we can ask forgiveness for it and get our life cleaned up to keep our prayer life open. Our prayer list here is always our military men and women at the top of the list, always our veterans that have already served us, our policemen, our firefighters, and our first responders who are out there doing everything they can do on the front lines for us every single day. We appreciate those men and women. We ask for you to keep them safe and help them not to lose heart in these crazy days. We ask you to be with our school kids that are away from school so some of them won't be eaten uh, on a regular basis. And it's a heartbreaking situation. It's just beyond what we can do uh, in so many ways. So um, there's such a need in this world and we hope and pray that we can help with the need uh, that's out there. And uh, But it takes us all working together. That's what it's going to be uh, for us to get where we need to be. So we're thankful that there is such a way um, uh, for us to get there and to do the things you need us to do, Lord. So again, be with those school kids, be with those teachers. They need a break. Uh, the medical community needs a break. There's lots of, of industries that they're just pounding and pounding and pounding on people and people are just giving up. And, uh, you know, it's just not like it used to be, man. People would pound on you and pound on you and you just kept going to work, and kept enjoying it. But nowadays, you know, there's a generation or two of people that said, we're not taking it. And so I don't know what it means, but it's going to get crazier and crazier, Lord, just like you said it would in the Bible. So that ought to be enough proof for us to see what's going on. So, Lord, I hope and pray that we can get where we need to be for you and do the things you need us to be doing. And we'll give you the praise and the honor and the glory for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. We appreciate you. Um, well, once again, the suicide thing is, a, is an interesting thing. I believe that the eternal security is eternal security. And, and we just read that the only sin that's not forgivable is the sin of um, blasphemy, which is to say no to the Holy Spirit. So I wouldn't say for anybody to commit suicide and try this out because as you can imagine, there's no there's no way to get forgiveness for that sin. But yet at the same time, Jesus died for the sins of yesterday, today, and forevermore, right? So when you surrendered that day and you got saved, Jesus died for every sin that you had in the past, every sin that you would commit that day, and every sin that you have committed in the future. Now, there would be people that would fight me to the last breath on this. But I don't believe God sits in heaven with an eraser and he erases your name off the list when you have a bad day and he writes your name back in when you have a good day, right? I believe God knows where our heart is. He knows how you're struggling or how people are struggling. He knows about the mental health of people. And, and you know, I'm going to say, you know, and my, my what I say matters none. But I'm going to say, I'm going to read that verse that we just read. The only blasphemy that can keep you out of heaven is not receiving Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that he has prepared to put in your heart. And that's all I can say, really. So, All right, guys, I got to roll. But read that chapter 12. It looks like there's a lot of interest in that. Uh, and that may clarify that thing just a little bit. Google is a good thing. Google, what is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? And just see what it tells you. And maybe we could talk a little bit about it tomorrow. You guys have a wonderful day. See you soon.